What's up, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to this online trombone lesson. Today's lesson is the first in a new series that I'm launching dealing with transcribing on the trombone. Now, these transcription lessons aren't simply going to be me playing the transcription and sort of looking at the sheet music. We're really going to break down some of the great solos that trombonists have played throughout the tradition of this music. Not only are you going to hear me play a little bit of each one of these solos, but we're actually going to break them down, look at what makes them great, and learn how we can use them to help us improve as improvisers. All right, for the first one of these solos, I wanted to start with one of my favorite modern trombone players. That is the great Michael Dees. Up top, you heard me play 16 bars of his solo on the tune three and one off of his album, Decisions. I think this album and this track particularly really typify his approach to playing jazz trombone. The sound is really working, the feel is great. There's a great language. You can really hear the tradition. But also, once you actually kind of get inside the solo and start transcribing it, you realize that a lot of the ideas are very logical and in some ways almost simple and elegant in the sort of way he constructs the lines. And to say they're simple should not take anything away from Michael Dees' playing. They're simple in a way that they're sort of inevitable in the best way possible. They're exactly what we want to hear as the listener. In addition, because of this sort of logical clarity of the ideas, they're really easy to incorporate in our own playing. There's a real through line where we can look at the changes, see what he did, practice that through some different keys and think, okay, I can employ some of this stuff in my own playing. Now, the tune itself, three and one is a Thad Jones composition. We're not really gonna look too much at like the structure of this tune. It's a pretty straightforward tune with two fives. It goes through a couple different key centers, but we do wanna think about the form. It is an A, B, A, C form. And this will be important as we talk about the different sections of the solo. Now, before we jump in, nowhere in this lesson are you going to see just the entire solo scroll through and me play it. That's not what this lesson is about. This lesson is about assuming we've already listened, learned it on our horn, maybe we've written it out, and then we're kind of at the stage of what do I do next? So we're going to look through some key areas of this solo and decide, all right, this is a cool idea. I might learn this in all 12 keys, or this is a cool idea. How do I apply that? That is what this and the other lessons in this series will be about. The first place I want to highlight is the end of the B section of the first chorus. This is in a turnaround area, getting us back to the key of E flat. And as we can see in here, it's really all just pretty much kind of straight ahead bebop playing, outlining chords, hitting sevenths and thirds, all that type of stuff. Let's check it out. So you'll see in there, Mike Dees, he just plays right down through those arpeggios, lands on chord tones in some key places, hits some of the extensions of the chords in key places to add a little momentary tension and then release. This is what typifies bebop and it's just so clear here. This idea might seem, again, relatively simplistic or kind of like basic as far as change playing. But when you hear him playing, it just sounds wonderful because his sound is so good, his feel is so good, he plays with a lot of conviction. And that's what we want to take away in our playing. If we can make these simple ideas, clear ideas sound really great, we can capture a little bit of what Mike D sounds like. Now, the next idea we're going to key in on is at the end of the second A section, kind of transitioning into the C section of the first chorus. Here he plays this idea. <laughs> Now again, we can see here he plays sort of an arpeggio-based idea to work his way through the chords, and we see this really common root to major seven, to flat seven, to third resolution through a two five. Very, very common bebop idea. Now, if we move forward to the G7 chord, we can see he actually takes that same idea and transposes it into a different key, but not to the key of G7 necessarily. He's actually playing kind of a D minor shape, and he's implying the two that goes along with that G7. Our eventual resolution point is that C7 chord in this case. And so he makes a 2-5-1 to that C chord so he can fit that same idea that really fits well on a 2-5-1. And you can actually see the way he resolves here, it's kind of interesting. On that C7 chord, he actually hits a B natural on the downbeat of one, just to make that idea sort of flow through in the same way. And then he does a little enclosure to land on the B flat on the downbeat of two. So there's again, a momentary tension and release. Now, admittedly, that's a section that I had to listen through many times with headphones and even slow down to see, is he really playing a B natural there? 
or is he landing on a B flat and maybe I just don't have that line quite right? And I decided that he did keep that idea exactly transposed, landed the B natural, and then resolved to the B flat on beat two to make it inside the C7 chord. All right, our next idea occurs in the first A section of the second chorus. Here he plays this fast triplet line that ascends through a series of small arpeggios. Now admittedly, I can't play this line all the way up to tempo. I have to slow it down. If I was playing with a recording, I would do my best, but I would probably make a mess of it in some ways because he just plays it so clean and clear in sort of this middle lowish register of the instrument. That's one of the things that's impressive about his playing is his immense facility on lines like this. Now, when we actually look at what he's playing, again, it's something that's relatively clear, relatively simple. It's arpeggios. In this case, he's mostly playing diatonic arpeggios or diatonic triads. There's a few other things going on here, and he kind of connects chord tones in an interesting way through the first sort of couple beats of this line. But a lot of this is just diatonic triads. We could either think of them being an E flat major or maybe F minor, with a few exceptions in there. Even if you're like me and you can't play this idea up to the tempo that Michael Dees does, you can take this concept and move it on your horn and work on it to get it into your own playing. So what we might want to do is, let's say we're going to be in F minor. We're going to create diatonic triads in F minor. So our mode that we're going to be using is an F Dorian mode, and we need to know the mode in this case to know what the other notes beyond the primary chord tones are going to be. We're going to create triads off of each note of this scale with no accidental. So it's all going to be inside of that Dorian mode. Now that was all ascending. With most of these scale patterns, you can play them in a number of permutations. So as you were ascending the scale, you could actually descend the chords. Or as you're ascending the scale, you could ascend the chords. And as you descend the scale, you could descend the chord. There would be a lot of different ways you could practice it. However, the one that I really like to do on this exercise is actually alternating. So I go up one chord, down the next. Up the next, down the next. This creates a nice pattern, and in some ways it's actually also a little easier to execute on the instrument because there aren't as many jumps. Now, this concept, you could move this through all 12 keys, through as many different types of different scales as you could handle, and really get this into your playing. This is a big area of language in jazz, and actually this is something you'd really find at home in maybe J.J. Johnson's playing. He, he plays a lot of these type of ideas in his solos as well. Okay, our final big idea for this solo is to check out what happens really in the very next section is the end of the first A of that second chorus. Now, the idea he plays sounds like this. We can hear that that starts with just a nice bebop sort of 2-5-1 idea through that A minor 7 to D7. And then he does something a little more interesting. He plays this triplet figure. He takes that same motive and he moves it through some different key centers. Now, what you'll see is he actually just moves it by the circle of fifths. So the first motive is kind of a B minor seven idea, and then he plays an E minor seven idea, then an A minor seven idea. So he is moving counterclockwise around the circle of fifths. However, those are not the chords that he's on. In this case, he starts it off of the third of that G7 chord. And that makes him resolve to sort of an interesting place on the C7 chord, right? He resolves uh, kind of on the sharp 11, which is a nice little crunchy note there for a moment. And then he just moves around that circle, but that makes him kind of encounter some non-chord tones. Some B naturals on the C7 chord. He lands on a big juicy E natural on that F7 chord. This is another place that I had to listen to many times with headphones slowed down to really see, am I being accurate with this transcription? And if I'm being honest, in some of those triplet figures, I'm not 100% sure if I am because it's very hard to hear each individual note. Maybe somebody with a little better ears than I am could tell me, hey, is this really what Michael Dees is playing? But after listening to it many times, I decided that I think he's just keeping that motive of this minor seven shape and just transposing it through those different uh, key centers, even though it actually kind of butts up against some of the chords that are there. The idea is so strong and that melody is so convincing that uh, we don't really hear the dissonance. We just hear that melody as being transposed and maybe he's a little outside of the chord, but then he's right back in after that and it all makes sense. This is another great concept that you can apply to your playing. So we would take that shape, this minor seven shape and sort of this rhythmic figure, and we would move it around the circle of fifths just like he does. Now, in the example I have here, rather than starting it off of the third, I chose to start it off of the fifth on dominant seventh chords. If you really have a good knowledge of 
your dominant chords, you know that you can work off the fifth note of the scale and kind of think of the minor five. So if we're in C7, we could think of a G minor sort of shape or maybe a G minor pentatonic on that C7 dominant, and that will give us some cool alternate sounds that we can use. So I chose that approach and I just moved it through the circle through the first couple keys. The great thing about this type of idea is it's very flexible. If we wanted to apply this to a different chord or maybe get a different sound, we can start on a different member of that chord, but still keep the motive the same. Let's look at how we can apply this to a major seven chord and get some interesting sounds that will cover a broader range of the harmony that's here. So if we're on a C major seven chord, we're gonna start this idea on the major seven, on the B. So we're gonna be creating a B minor seven chord and sticking that on top of a C major seven chord. Now the idea is gonna stay exactly the same, but by starting on this note, we're actually gonna be able to access all of the upper extensions of that C major seven chord. We start on the B, which is the major seven, then we go to the D, which is the nine, the F sharp, which is a sharp 11, and the A, which is the 13. <laughs> So by keeping this basic shape of a minor seven chord, we can actually access all of the upper extensions of that C chord and get kind of some of the more tension filled notes that when we eventually resolve, it's gonna feel good. Now, the process that we went through on these last two ideas is really what we want to do at the end of any transcription process. Once we've listened a lot, learned it on our horn, maybe written it out, we wanna look for key ideas that we think, oh, that's a cool idea, I can apply that in my solo. Or, oh, this is interesting, why did this player do this? That's what we really wanna think about. So we really get inside of these solos and get beyond just learning notes, rhythms, that sort of thing. All right, the last thing I'm gonna leave you with today is just one final little nugget of this solo, and that happens at the end of the second A of the second chorus. Sounds a little bit like this. Now, I'd really encourage you to go listen to the original Michael D's recording of this, um, maybe after you listen to this lesson, so you can see how this fits into context. Once you do that, I want you to go find the Slide Hampton recording of him playing Confirmation on the album Exodus. Fast forward to about two minutes and 10 seconds. That's in the middle of Slide's solo. And I want you to tell me if you think the ideas that Slide is playing there and that idea that I just referenced in this Michael D solo are connected. To my ear, there's no doubt that there is a connection there. And that's the great thing about Michael Dees' playing. You hear the entirety of the jazz trombone tradition in his playing. And do I think that he was sort of thinking back, oh, I'm gonna sneak that slide look in there? I doubt it. It was probably just something that was naturally in his head. He heard the idea, he executed it. But if you're a jazz trombone player and you listen to those knowing both slide solo and Michael Dees' solo, that's really kind of like, I don't know, a fun inside baseball connection that you can make when you're dealing with this sort of thing. All right, if you made it all the way through this first transcription breakdown lesson, I encourage you to hit me with a comment, any other solos that you might want me to take apart in this way and think about, hey, what are the cool things that are going on here? Why does this solo work? And other than that, we'll see all of you in the woodshed.